office. So I will just say hello to Miss Cynthia. We also have Melissa Price Crom from the um, North Carolina Voters for Clean Elections. We have Alexa Whaley with us from the Millennial Action Project. And we have Tyler Day here from Common Cause North Carolina. So I'm going to stop talking. Thank you all very much one more time. Um, and I'm gonna turn this over to Miss Cynthia. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Alexa. And um, let's also thank Alexa for pulling together such an amazing panel, um, a topic that I'm sure most of us um, either know something about or are very concerned about how it is impacting us and our, our society. So once again, I'm Cynthia Wallace. I am one of half of the co-founders, um, Helen Post Mills. We're doing double duty. So she is at an in-person event tonight. Um, and we started this organization um, a little over a year and a half ago to really reach out um, to unheard um, folks of color as well as those younger folks um, in rural places. And out of that came this series of um, quarterly conversations focused on um, young people or young at heart as one of our emails recently said. Um, so this has definitely been a topic that Helen and I talked about quite a bit um, as we started this organization being a key concern, um, which is information. What is true, what is not, how do you understand that? And so we're excited to have this amazing panel of experts on this topic. So with that, I will um, turn it over to uh, Melissa, if you would um, just give a brief introduction and let folks know a little bit more about you. Hi, everyone. My name is Melissa Price Crom. I'm the director of the North Carolina Voters for Clean Elections. Um, since 1999, we've been a pro-democracy coalition here in North Carolina. Um, and today I'm going to talk to you a little bit about um, what this information is, how do you find it, and um, where you can get some uh, good sources on this. Um, on um, when you see disinformation. All right, I'm gonna share my screen. Well, before that, we're gonna let everybody do a quick introduction, Melissa, and then I'll, okay. I'll give you the nod. Um, Alexa, why don't you um, introduce yourself? Yeah, hello everyone. I'm Alexa Whaley and I'm a media coordinator with the Millennial Action Project. And at MAP, we work with young elected officials. Uh, we have a network of over 1600 elected officials that are all under the age of 45. And so today on our panel, we're going to be talking about um, kind of Gen Z and millennials and how they approach mis and disinformation, what we're seeing on the front lines and state legislators, how young people are combating it, and uh, what more we can do to, to bring up this issue. All right. Thank you so much, Alexa. And last but certainly not least, Tyler, please introduce yourself. Hey everyone, my name is Tyler Day and I am the Policy and Civic Engagement Manager at Common Cause North Carolina. And I am here to talk uh, to you about ways that you can report and combat against mis and disinformation and also show you some examples of uh, types of mis and disinformation that we're seeing. Uh, I've been tracking uh, some of the things uh, that have been going on throughout the state. Um, so happy to share that. All right. Well, awesome. Well, as you all can see, we have an August panel of experts in this um, arena, all hitting our under 40 per parts of the conversation. And so we will start with uh, Melissa. Um, if you could, um, I know you have a few slides, um, share with us, um, you know, a definition <clears throat> of misinformation and disinformation. So we're all grounded on what we're going to be talking about over the next hour. And what's the difference between them? Um, I'm curious, I'm sure a lot of folks here, misinformation, disinformation, what's the difference? So we'd love to see um, you um, ground us on everything. Okay, all right, now I get to share my screen. <laughs> all right. <clears throat> And so disinformation, um, we're gonna first start with misinformation. This is the false accidental mistruths that are not, intended to purposely harm, but are amplifying bad information that has a real effect. Um, an example of this um, was we got a call into the um, the, the, the hotline. Uh, we, there's a, 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 a election protection hotline run out of Demency and a um, radio station was basically telling um, people to bring two IDs to vote or they would have to vote provisionally. They meant if you were like a first time voter, 
um but it was it you know it, it could have had a real effect and um thankfully I coached uh soccer for one of the DJ sons and had the phone number ready and called and you know dealt with it the good old-fashioned way so that's an example of misinformation disinformation is um you know more purposeful, um, false and misleading information um, that's spread with intentional, this is the key part, that it's, it's spread with intentional harm or lies um, invented for political gain. And, and this is the, the worrisome form of disinformation that we're seeing um, a lot of. The third kind is called malinformation. This is very purposely, um, you know, decontextualized truths that are weaponized for political gain. And I'll show you one quick example of that. In 2016, we saw this uh, this example of malinformation. Um, save time, avoid the line, vote at home. Newsflash, you can't vote at home, <laughs> you can't text to vote, um, but this is, it looks really professional. It looks like it's actually from the Hillary Clinton campaign, but this was, this was a way um, to try to, you know, depress voter turnout in uh, 2016. All right, thank you so much. I mean, I think that um, was very educational and because the, the terms get thrown around. And so now we know, you know, disinformation is where it's malicious, intended to do harm and misinformation. I know probably some of us get text messages or something that someone saw and they send it out innocently <laughs> um, and they think it, it was true. So awesome. Now, um, Melissa, do you also have some good resources for fact checking? Um, so yes, um, you know, I generally tell people, um, you know, fact checking um, needs to be done uh, in, you know, in general, uh, you know, trusted news sites, um, but you can also um, do like Snopes or Politico, PoliticoVac, which I can put um, some uh, of those into the chat right now. Um, what's different about this cycle that we didn't have uh, fully in effect um, a last uh, election cycle is that uh, some of the social media platforms now have fact checkers. And so it's not just, you know, you have the IEs and they check, you report, and then there's, you know, a, an independent, an independent, not the platform agency actually doing the fact checking. So. All right. Well, awesome. What about um, Tyler or Alexa? Anything to add about those different types of disinformation or, you know, good resources to fact check? Um, I, I can also add um, uh, another good uh, resource that we have are nonpartisan voter guides. And I know at Common Cause, uh, we have a, a voter guide that we co-produce with Democracy North Carolina. Uh, you can go to ncvoterguide.org and view um, the, the, these guides. Um, and uh, I don't think all of them are all published yet, but they will be published in the coming um, uh, weeks. And so, uh, and we also have print versions of, of, the, of those guides. And so you, you can see how candidates have answered questions um, and, and links to their websites and, and so forth. Um, and also I know a Democracy North Carolina has a, a resource called ncvoter.org. That's really helpful as well. Uh, it has a lot of good information on how to register and um, and stuff like that, so that you don't get, you know, duped by the text to vote. Um, which I, when I saw that, I just thought to myself, "This is not American Idol, <laughs> you know, <laughs> text Hillary." To, it's you know, awesome. Um, anything, Alexa, you'd like to add? Um, you know. Any good resources that you found? Um, for yeah, fact well, don't want to add to misinformation um, just because we mostly track state legislators who are producing bills on behalf of that, but happy to talk about more of that stuff on how you can get involved with your state legislator at the local level. But don't have any resources off, off the top of my head and, and don't want to spread anything. So, okay, no worries. All right, Tyler. Um, I think you um, may have some examples of misinformation you might want to share with us and a, a very cool video. Yes, um, just one moment.
Okay, can everyone see my screen? Okay, um, I wanted to share with you some um, uh, information about what to do when you see mis and disinformation online. Um, and then I'll also show you some examples uh, of this. So uh, one of the things that is really most important is do not engage and do not amplify. Uh, if you see something, I know uh, if you see something that you that you know is false, it's very tempting to want to reply or you know to comment and say no, this is wrong, this is this is incorrect. But do not do that um, because uh, Facebook and Twitter and all these social media platforms have algorithms, and uh, they will show that content to more people based upon how much people are engaging with it. Um, and so uh, you, you want to make sure that you are not uh, engaging and not amplifying. Um, you can take a screenshot of it and report it to our tip line. We have a, a tip line um, and, and I can put the link to that in the chat. Uh, and it's into North Carolina specific tip line. And all of uh, these tips go into a database that help us see uh, and track uh, mis and disinformation in real time and also see if there are certain narratives forming or certain trends going on. Uh, and then we have um, our hotline 888, our vote where you, you, that you can report um, mis and disinformation to as well. Um, so, um, you know, malignant actors are spreading mis and dis or disinformation, I should say, and uh, they want to see their claims amplified. So even if it's being debunked, uh, unfortunately, those lies are still spreading. Uh, and so it's much wiser just to report it without trying to correct it. And uh, to show you some examples of mis uh, and disinformation, I wanted to, to show you this video. Um, I found it really uh, insightful. It's, um, it's not from uh, th this uh, past uh, election. It, it's um, uh, from, from before, I think it's from 2020 actually, but um, it does a good job of showing you the types of uh, disinformation that's out there and how they are using micro-targeting to actually specifically target Black and Latino voters. From the wrong election date on Twitter to fake robocalls. If you vote by mail, your personal information will be part of a public database. Experts are now sounding the alarm about digital disinformation aimed squarely at Black and Latino voters. Since January, almost a quarter of the 13 million mentions of vote by mail on social media included misinformation, which is why digital disinformation experts like Andre Banks have created virtual war rooms across the country aimed at flagging and fighting false messages before they spread. These are systemic uh, attempts, uh, strategies to reduce people's political power, and they have a real impact. Many Black and Latino voters in swing states like Florida say bad information is dangerous to democracy. How they vote could, could determine, you know, which way the election sways. Do you feel like your communities are being targeted more or less by misinformation than the election year? More. More, because it was, it was effective. In 2015? Yes. Well, and now it's coming from the government directly. So we put them to the test using social media posts we found online. So you all have cards here. And I need you to tell me whether you believe these memes are real or false. Vote by mail boosts Black turnout. Real or fake? Probably in general. No, I feel like Black folks despise vote by mail. Real, 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 fake. The answer is real. Voter turnout has been higher this year, according to preliminary data. This is a tweet. Doing my part and voting early. DM me for convenient locations to drop your ballot off. Okay, hold on up for me. Real, 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 fake. The answer is fake. That black ballot box is not a real ballot box. This is a tweet. It says by Caleb Little Ford Black for Trump. Leaving the Democratic Party has been on my mind for a few weeks now. Is there real on the Trump train? Is this a real tweet? Real or fake? That gentleman is actually a singer and his image has just been reposted to you. For that. By a Russian bot. Yep. <laughs> Have you seen things like this in your social media feed? Uh, yes. I'm the prime target. I'm an Afro Latina. <laughs> so they said we both. It's laughable if it were scary. We can overcome this. This is America. We need to call it what it is when we see it. 
an online battle with real world consequences. Morgan Radford, NBC News, Miami. NBC News. So, uh, yes. So you can see that shows you the micro targeting that I was talking about. Uh, really uh, trying to target voters specifically different demographic groups and um, and you know get them to believe something that's not true that could affect um, how they vote or even get them you know to not vote at all. Um, a few other things I wanted to show you here. These are flyers of uh, election integrity events, I guess you would call them. Uh, and there have been election integrity influencers, who have been uh, going across the state, really across the country, uh, but, but across the state, um, spreading disinformation about our elections, uh, claiming you know that you can't trust voting machines, or uh, that uh, you know there are modems in the machines that are connected, or you know all the very um, you know uh, wild conspiracy theories, um, and, uh, and so uh, we, we're seeing this, and I know in Surrey County uh, in particular, uh, there, uh, the elections director there was actually threatened by a uh, political party chair who told her that if he, he did not get access to the voting machines, that uh, he was going to have her fired or get her pay reduced. So uh, we're seeing, um, you know, it's, it's very concerning, some of these things that we're seeing. Um, and I'll just show you, this is a photo from a Surrey County Board of Commissioners meeting back in May, in which they actually had one of these influencers speak. He was uh, actually, um, a group of them were on the agenda for the Board of Commissioners meeting, which just kind of floored me, the fact that they would uh, put uh, them on the agenda and give them a platform like this. And you can see the crowd there. It was very, very well attended. I strongly doubt most uh, commissioners meetings are that well attended. And um, just recently, I've been looking into Carteret County, where it looks like um, some of the same things are happening. They actually had uh, a speaker, just like in Surrey, on the meeting agenda uh, to talk about this. And there were actually multiple commissioners who sympathized with it and, you know, were, uh, was, you know, giving credibility to it, saying, oh, we need to, to look into uh, the 2020 election results. So, um, you know, it, it's very concerning. Um, you know, it's, this is, the majority of people do not believe this, thankfully, but uh, there is a vocal minority uh, that, that, is, uh, that is spreading these, these lies. Uh, and lastly, uh, we have seen groups doing door-to-door -door canvassing, um, and uh, this is actually um, an a, um, article highlighting a, an elderly woman who was approached by a, a couple of canvassers who were, uh, they, they wanted to know if uh, her husband was home because they believed that her husband voted, uh, or her husband was not alive in 2020. Uh, this, there's this theory about uh, you know, people who were dead, who uh, or who had votes attributed to them. And, and we know that this is not accurate. All of uh, the votes from 2020 uh, can be, you know, these votes were uh, audited and verified by the, uh, the count, all the county board of elections and the state board of elections. Uh, and um, uh, they, they uh, she was really concerned by this and actually uh, referred it to her local news um, uh, because I mean, the, these people came, they did not even identify themselves or, or I should say, I guess, who, what organization they were with. Uh, and, you know, they have clipboards, it looks kind of official. Um, and so uh, this is something that we're seeing as well. Uh, uh, groups doing door-to-door -door canvassing, trying to find an, uh, anomalies or, or things to point to, to claim, oh, voter fraud is a big problem when we know it's not. No, thank you so much. That was um, very helpful and informative. I know it was, um, I heard a story this morning on the news um, about a similar situation to what you just showed in Washington state happening this year in 2022, where um, folks looking like official folks from the board of elections 
or going door to door asking voters different questions about fairness and seeming like they were coming from the Board of Elections. And it made me wonder, and I'd love if you guys have any input on how, you know, it's kind of gone from mis and disinformation online to actually face to face, a little more aggressive face to face um, misinformation. And have you all seen that? And it made me worry too, because we do a lot of canvassing with the New Rural Project. That's our bread and butter to help folks understand in these rural places about the election, understanding their barriers and really getting a chance to listen to them and hoping that that doesn't now impact folks who are doing honest um, canvassing with some of these other tax tactics that are happening. And Melissa, I see you came off mute. <laughs> no, that is the concern right now is that um, online disinformation is evolving to offline problems. And so, you know, what um, um, Tyler just showed you is, you know, uh, pieces of the big lie driving um, individuals to go and um, voter intimidation squads, basically door-to-door uh, -door vote harassers to harass people at their homes. Uh, we are also very concerned about how these um, election deniers are now flooding um, the ranks of um, election administrators and workers and poll workers and what they, that could actually become an offline problem in this election cycle. Yeah, so there's still a lot of work to do. And like I said, it seems like it's evolving as well, um, probably post-January 6th. Um, and one of the things I know Alexa was mentioning that's happening in Moore County just tonight, and I actually went to one a couple weeks ago in Charlotte, is the North Carolina Trusted Elections Tour. And that is a, a bipartisan, nonpartisan group of Democrats, Republicans, independents that are sharing information with trusted real elected officials, <laughs> um, people that work for the Board of Elections who are not partisan sharing information about how the voting process works, how the voting machines work, how secure elections really are. And thank you, Melissa, for putting that on in the chat, but please go out. Um, Jennifer Roberts um, is one of the um, co-chairs of this. So there are folks that are actually on the ground also trying to combat some of the election um, misinformation that's been going around. So Alexa, let me bring you into the conversation. Um, Excited about what Millennial Action does, um, focusing on elected officials under 45. And um, the New Rule Project definitely has a lot of focus on, on folks around that same age and getting them engaged and more civically involved. So can you tell us about some ways that Millennials and Gen Zs are, are leaders in combating misinformation? Yeah, so it's been actually pretty encouraging over here at Millennial Action Project. Um, we've seen a lot of state legislators really step up to the plate and start to either introduce or pass laws to combat mis- and disinformation. Um, most recently, we issued a report, I think back in March or something, I will definitely drop the link, where um, we came up with the bills all passed in a bipartisan way that our young legislators are really attacking this. Um, they aren't canvassing, but they are attacking it through through some like pretty practical laws. Um, I saw in the chat, um, you know, what we should do about Spanish speaking voters. Uh, most recently in Virginia, some legislators in our network um, prohibited misinformation um, or misinforming voters that are um, in a language that's in a language that they can't understand. Um, so it seems kind of like common sense no brainer, but they made it into law that you cannot use another language to manipulate voters um, who where English is not their first language. Um, in Florida, the introduced in committee, it hasn't passed, but they're kind of trying to bring it up um, to address manipulated videos and images. Um, in Tennessee, this is actually a really cool bipartisan bill where they um, prohibited foreign organizations to um, donate to national political campaigns, which I feel is definitely something bipartisan that everyone can get involved on just um, to stop foreign interference with elections. Um, so really just finding the ways that Republicans and Democrats can come together, the way that 
the older generation and the younger generation have, can come together um, is really what our legislators are up to. Uh, also, one thing that was really cool is, uh, I think it was in Oregon, they are just produced a bill that protects election workers so they don't get harassed at their home. Um, they get a larger fine if people start showing up to their home or coming to them with harassment. And so, yeah, there's really a lot of ways that young people can get involved at the state level through law um, to to combat this. And I think one, I know, um, Tyler, what you shared was how a lot of that disinformation and mis disinformation was targeted at Black and Latino voters. I wonder, Alexa, and I don't know if, if you've experienced this with um, these legislators, how much of that's targeted at younger folks as well? Those that may not, um, you know, be the readers of, you know, NBC News websites and <laughs> Washington Post and different things that have been around for a long time that in look at YouTube videos, how much of this, and I don't know, or Alexa or Melissa or Tyler can share how much of this is targeted at younger people. Um, we start a lot of our work on vaccine, um, you know, vaccine equity. And as we know, there was a lot of misinformation being spread. And that also influenced more younger folks also to be against this vaccine, even though they've had vaccines their entire young childhood and even probably many to get into college had to take certain vaccines. So I'd love if you all had any information about how this is targeting that particular millennial and Gen Z populations are being targeted by mis and disinformation. Yeah, definitely. Uh, we don't particularly collect data on that, but um, it definitely has been a problem. Like you said, um, you know, the younger Gen Zs are not really being attacked by something on Facebook, but maybe something on TikTok. Um, and it's kind of dangerous when there's a just growing platforms where a lot of voices um, and you kind of need to fact check everything. Um, but yeah, we, we don't collect data on that. I know Citizen Data just released a brand new report, uh, which I'd be happy to drop the link on. Um, I think they called it their trustworthy source for elections, and they have a lot of interesting data in there. Okay, um, Tyler, so you came off me. Yes, um, I just wanted to also point out that uh, when we see uh, mis and disinformation that uh, like what Melissa shared, um, the the graphic about texting Hillary, what they that specifically um, you know affects younger voters and voter people who haven't voted because it 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 um, it uh, capitalizes on the fact that they may not know the rules of the system. Those who have been voting for a while would know, oh, okay, I'm not, I can't text to vote. Uh, but those who don't, um, you may not know. And so when we see uh, things like that in, in regard to the rules of voting, uh, that has a disproportionate effect, I think, on younger voters and, and on, on newer voters. Yep. And I know, Melissa, I think you mentioned it a little bit, um, which is how do you fact check? So that is something that I, you know, um, as someone that uses social media, but probably more the legacy Facebook user, because <laughs> I'm not a millennial or a Gen Z, but I find myself looking at things that folks are sending and taking, sending me either by text or seeing it on social media or before I share it, like throwing it into Snopes or even just looking at that link and going and investigating the source of the information. So taking like five minutes or three minutes to just, you know, if it's not a media source I'm familiar with, doing a little bit of extra research. So I'd be curious if you all have some ways that people, you know, can fact check information. No, I think that's a really good point. I think um, in today's day and age, we have to realize that um, it just because you read it on the internet doesn't mean it's true. <laughs> And so, um, you know, being able to go back and check sources, um, check reputable sources to make sure um, it's true, um, check multiple sources. Um, you know, if I read something online and I'm like, is that really true? I question myself a lot when I read things and I'm like, I'm going to go check into this. I'm, you know, we have a lot of tools to our disposal <laughs> um, and we can Google things. We can look at reputable sites. We can look at news stories. 
um, you know, we can dig in to find out whether or not something is real or not. But um, I think you guys are making a really good point about, you know, especially how this is targeted to young voters. Um, let's take a minute, um, you know, for a lot of young voters, there's a lot more barriers to, uh, to voting and engaging in the democratic process. Um, you know, for me, I've lived in the same house for 14 years. I go to the same polling. So I don't have to change my registration. I know where I'm going. It's the same thing every time. But if you're young, you're probably moving around a lot and changing your registration and having to figure out um, how to do this. So um, I do want to make sure everyone sees this link that has um, a lot of our kind of pro voter content. Um, it does have that uh, website, um, NC Voter. Um, it's got Vote 411. It's got information about um, how uh, you know how to vote in high schools, educational toolkits, all that type of stuff, um, just to help you guys um, spread good information because there's a lot of bad information out there right now. So we would really love if, um, if a if you needed help, here's resources, but also help out uh, your fellow friends, Put post this up on your social media, get good voter content out there to combat the bad voter content that's out there. And, and Tyler, did you have anything, I know you'd mentioned Junkopedia or any other um, sites, and then I have a question to follow up on reputable sources. Um, yes, um, uh, I, I um, I wanted to point out uh, uh, one way that uh, people are fighting back, particularly younger uh, voters. Um, and uh, there's this organization called uh, Birds Aren't Real. Uh, put the link to it in the chat. Um, and you may be thinking, well, what is this? Uh, well, it is, um, they, they created this uh, parody conspiracy theory, basically to make fun of how ridiculous uh, some of these uh, you know, actual conspiracy theories are. Uh, and so the theory uh, is that uh, birds were replaced by drones um, and that, uh, you know, we don't have birds around us. We have drones that are spying on us all the time. They are charging on power lines. Um, they are going and, um, uh, you know, every year they, they fly, they migrate. Well, the new models are coming in to replace the old models. Mm -hmm. Um, and if you look at that website, yes, uh, Melissa put the website there as well. Um, there's a, a, a video clip uh, of the, uh, the founder of the, the whole group, and he, uh, he has a whole spiel that he does on this uh, news program um, that really, I think, is very good. And um, I, I think it also just highlights as well some of the tactics that we see used by um, these these um, uh, conspiracy theory groups. Um, I mean, they'll. If you look at that video, you'll see him talk about things like, "Oh, there's all this evidence," but he doesn't ever explain what the evidence is. <laughs> so, uh, or he'll say, "Oh, we heard whispers coming from the White House back." Uh, you know, it's this started in 1976 with whispers. Well, what are whispers? Who who specifically is saying what? Or what, you know, and so these are the types of things, you know, that you want to question, because if you if you're getting information and it's it's very vague like this, there are whispers or there's, you know, there's all this evidence, but they don't back it up or they don't they aren't specific um, and, and they aren't, aren't showing you the actual research, then, you know, that you may want to question it. So I think it's a it's a really um, good project um, and it will provide you some comic relief as well which I think we probably all need. Yes, need I, think, <laughs> I agree. And um, and I'm going to jump into some of the questions we've been getting from the chat. But one last thing, I know, Melissa, you said a lot of, you know, you said reputable sources. And I know there are a lot of, um, you know, polling that shows faith in traditional media is probably at an all-time low. And so, you know, I know there's, you know, a lot of folks that watch, get a lot of their news from sources like YouTube. And Tyler, as you mentioned, there's no accreditation to where the source of the data is from. How do you all uh, define reputable sources and how do we try to get that out to not just younger people, but I think that's definitely a big portion, but also some of the other folks that have kind of, you know, started to question traditional media sources. Definitely. Um, I definitely think that there is, 
various different forms of media out there right now. But, um, you know, definitely looking at uh, news outlets that are, you know, either peer reviewed or they're backed up by like, you know, you know, uh, that they've been around for a while, that, that they're a traditional news source. Um, you know, I, I would, you know, and then always look to make sure it's said in multiple places. So the multiple sources. Uh, and Tyler, I saw you got, came off mute. Yes, I, I just wanted to share uh, something that I uh, came across recently uh, and I put the link in the chat. It's called Ground News. Uh, and I think it's a really um, helpful source. What what they do is they um, uh, show you news stories, and it's uh, they show you the political um, uh, leanings of that source, and you can see how news is being covered by different sources. They also will show you who owns, you know, like what company owns that uh, news source, so you can see. Oh, okay, News Corp is owns Fox News or, you know, or whatever, uh, you know, Time Warner, or uh, uh, I should say Warner Discovery now owns uh, CNN. Um, and, and you can, um, you know, see who's behind uh, the, those organizations. Uh, so I think it's really, really helpful. And also you can see what stories are being covered if there are stories that are being covered more on the right or on the left uh, and, and so forth. No, that sounds like an awesome site. And when I say my research, those are some of the things that I do. I say, well, I've never heard of this media outlet. So let me Google that. And then I even Google the founders and who is behind it. That's a lot of work. So I don't think most people would do that level of work. So if there's one place that you can go, that, that sounds excellent. Um, so here's a question that was in the chat. Um, is there a way to make a distinction between election protection versus election integrity campaigns. What might you know a message example be from these different um, camps? So election protection versus election integrity. Uh, let's see if uh, Tyler can help me out here a little bit, but election protection is definitely ensuring um, that um, uh, eligible voters get to the ballot and are able to vote. Um, election integrity um, tends to be a lot about uh, systematic uh, issues, making you doubt um, the, the democratic systems that we have uh, to cause uh, uh, to sow discord and confusion. Yes, I, I would uh, agree with that. And um, I'll also say, I know we often use the term election protection um, in referring to some of the work that we do and volunteers who uh, are um, poll monitors who, who are um, outside the polling sites, um, uh, helping to report any problems and that type of thing. Um, so, uh, you know, uh, not to be confused with election integrity. Um, so, uh, yeah. All right. And I know there was a some um, response to the question about Spanish media. Um, I know, Tyler, you mentioned um, some legislation um, and, and you did uh, Alexa as well. Anything else um, about, um, you know, other languages and misinformation and ways to combat it or other media? I know that question, I think, was more about radio uh, versus online. Yeah, well, as far as like the Gen Z and millennial perspective, I think a really tangible way to to get um, less mis and disinformation offline is just continuing to um, be a hard consumer against it. So I think because of the Gen Z and millennial outlash um, for what was going on with Twitter or Facebook or Instagram, we've had a lot of um, uh, we've had a lot of social media companies step up to the plate and now Twitter um, provides a provision where if you retweet an article without reading it, they'll say, do you want to read this first? Um, or Snapchat, which is a primarily young um, person platform. They've done really, really awesome things to boost civic engagement and boost democracy. Uh, they like registered over 1 million people to vote in 2020. Um, and so I think it's just the young people narrative that, you know, we are not going to put up with mis and disinformation and 
putting pressure on the social media companies to invest in their fact checkers. Uh, because like you said, all of this is a lot of work and young people are probably not going to want to go through all of that. And so it's really on the social media companies to um, be good democratic stewards for the platforms that they are heading. I appreciate it. And Melissa, do you have any um, pending legislation or anything you want to speak to um, that uh, may be out there to combat um, this issue? You're on mute. <laughs> yes. And so um, granted, our legislation uh, was this was done a couple of years ago and some of the platforms have stepped up on this challenge. Um, it's a, It was disclosure because a lot of the stuff you were seeing out there, you're like, who's who's doing this? You know, who's this by? Um, and we were examining our campaign finance laws and the outside spending entities, um, uh, independent expenditure committees. Um, basically, we hadn't updated the, the laws that require disclosure for outside entities. These are not like the candidates. These are, you know, moms and uh, dads for apple pie and the, those little groups that pop up every cycle. Um, uh, and they do something, uh, they do electioneering communications. And so um, when those pop up 30 days before the election on your digital, um, there's no law in North Carolina that says you have to say who you are. Some platforms are now making you do that. Um, but we uh, filed uh, legislation a couple years ago, it was House Bill 700, that would basically add in um, a digital ads to the current election, election and communication laws, which, you know, say for print and radio and newspaper, you know, and so it just you know, hadn't updated, or literally our laws hadn't updated with the technological mm -hmm. advances. Um, but you can learn um, more about uh, this particular type of disclosure, other types of disclosure that we're looking at, and a whole host of range of pro-democracy policies that we are advocating for in our um, report, A Blueprint for a Stronger democracy at the NC for the people uh, website. Okay, awesome. Um, and the, the one of my, uh, my last questions um, is, you know, how can citizens advocate for fact based um, information? What can we all do? Who wants to start? Um, I think you can you can vote, you can get involved with local politics and promote pro-democratic um, leaders who are for this and will produce legislation that protect um, or fight against mis and disinformation and protect our elections. Um, I think along with this, like I said, putting putting public pressure on on social media, if you're a young person, um, calling out mis and disinformation when you see it, if you see a fake article like, you know, call it out or actually you aren't supposed to engage with it um but don't yeah don't share it with friends um and I would just say I uh, like real news starts with you and so just being mindful of even if it falls into your own narrative not sharing stories even as tempting as they are um and being a good civic engagement and voting and canvassing for your local candidates awesome uh, Melissa I think the biggest thing you can do is if you see something, say something. So, you know, we want you to um, report it to us because we have direct lines to platforms um, who can deal with flags and takedowns. But also what we didn't say yet is also report it in platform. The, um, we've worked for many years to, you know, really uh, beef up the community standards on a lot of these platforms. And so, um, you know, you'll be able to click on like the right hand corner and it goes report, tweet, report a post and go through that process let the platforms know that you're seeing it because you're hitting them multiple times um, will increase the likelihood that they will um, take it down or flag it or do the thing where they put up um, uh, like a content flag. Um, one other thing that I uh, will also add is um, to support your, um, your local county board of elections. Um, and I'm saying this, you know, a lot of the mis and disinformation that I've been looking at is election related and, um, you know, just attending these meetings uh, and, and uh, you know, seeing what what is being said at these meetings. I mean, uh, it really has, has blown my mind some of the stuff that I've seen. I mean, there was a, um, a, a board member in Surrey County who said that he did not believe in early voting, didn't think that 
early voting is should be a thing because he thought that there was a connection between early voting and voter fraud and that you know the more early voting you you know you have in Surrey the more voter fraud that you'd have which we know is completely false um but uh you know I, you know it's important that people are there and that you um make your voice heard and you 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 know if you're there then you can let your commissioners know or your uh, board of elections members know hey no i don't agree with what you're saying or you know, what, what you're saying is not true um and uh you know fight for um or for um you know more early voting sites because that shows you there the the actual effect of the the disinformation having a, a direct effect then on things like the the amount of early voting sites that we have uh, another thing that they're they've talked about uh is getting rid of absentee voting uh, because there, you know, there are these theories that there's um, a connection there, uh, and that uh, there's all this voter fraud with our mail-in ballots, which we know is not true. So again, um, uh, you know, um, continuing to to advocate uh, for for these things, uh, and and you know, monitoring your your local county board of elections and supporting them, honestly, just uh, thanking them for the work that they do because. Uh, they, it, you know, I, I, um, I, I do not envy their job right now. It's, it's a lot. Um, so, uh, given the current political environment that we're in. So, as we were saying last year, thank a nurse, um, or two years ago, let's thank someone in the board of elections, thank a poll worker. <laughs> so we all need to do that. And Melissa, you wanted to add something. Speaking of thanking a poll worker, you can become a poll worker. Yes. There is a whole different job. <laughs> yes, if you click this link, we need poll workers. We need you to engage in democracy. We need you to be uh, there on election day. Click this link. You can, it'll help you get to your county and get you uh, to become a poll worker. I wonder if there's any effort. I know last, I'm um, in 2020, because of the height of the, it was the height of the pandemic. And most of the poll workers were older people, right? And so I remember being so heartened that so many young people stepped up to the plate and became poll workers. So I hope there is an effort to bring them back, <laughs> um, to make sure they, they come back and do those jobs because my hope was that we would be starting a new generation of poll workers with all of those younger folks who did that work in 2020. So. If I could just jump in for a minute, I did want to point out um, that I uh, actually this year uh, became a poll worker for the first time. So um, uh, I, I and I can say as well, it's a really great opportunity, I think, as well to learn about how the elections process works. So if you know if you've ever wanted to know about uh, how, how that process works, uh, then it's a it's a great uh, way to learn um, and, and support. So. But, uh, you know, I, I've enjoyed it thus far. So uh, excited for the general election. All right. Well, those are most of the questions I had, but we want to, um, I know we've been getting some in the chat, um, but we'd love to um, have you either put it in the chat or if you feel comfortable, um, come off mute and ask your question or even make, maybe you know something as well that you'd like to add to this conversation. Good evening. This is Jackie McLean. How's everyone? Hi, Jackie. I don't, I don't have a question, but with respect to how we gain poll workers, we um, conducted a voter registration drive this past week at the high school in Hope County. And at the same time, we um, provided applications for our 17 year olds and up to um, make application to work in the polls. And we've been doing this in Hope County for a number of years in which we um, get the high school students to work with us and they actually enjoy it. And if they do a really good job, they've actually been called back and extended an opportunity again to work. So that is one way to um, recruit poll workers um, at an age where you can help them understand the um, civic engagement piece and not only um, help them understand it, but to actually have them engaged in it, you know, from a real hands-on um, measure so that they fully understand 
what that process looks like and how important it is. Now that's an excellent um, process that you all are following and an excellent idea. So hopefully folks are, are seeing that and start recruiting at their high schools. Uh, thank you so much, Ms. McLean. Any other questions? Um, anybody want to come off mute? Um, Cynthia, this is Wilhelmina. Uh, good evening, everyone. I did want to ask Tyler if he could put up his slide again with the uh, resources about where who you would contact. I think it was his slides. Um, if you see some information that you think is disinformation, where you might report. Thank you. And Tyler, are you able to do that? Yes. Uh, just one second. Yeah, because these are some new places I've learned about as well. It was a really good, it was that one. Well, not that, yeah, that one. That was yeah. good. And is junkopedia.org, um, it has one for each state. Um, Tyler, or if you went, if you stopped at org, does it give you other states or is it just for North Carolina? Um, I know that there, it, it's a part of a nationwide um, effort, but I'm not sure. Melissa probably would know better uh, in terms of other specific state tip lines. So yeah, this is the North Carolina specific tip line. Other states have their own version of a tip line. There's a national tip line. It all goes into the same database and we all work on the back end on it where we go and we pick out trends, uh, problematic posts, and then there's a team that lifts them up directly up to platforms for flags and takedowns. When you all identify those trends, um, is it then it's more communicated with platforms or is there a way for it to be communicated to the public? for them to see what to look out for. Yes, um, um, uh, Common Cause produces a email once a week on the trends and um, we can, I can find the link for that real quick, hold on. <laughs> awesome. And one thing I don't know that we talked about and um, as I would be remiss, um, since we're the rules, new uh, rule project, uh, is to talk about rural folks and how misinformation, um, you know, can target them. As we talked about young people, we talked about, you know, Black and Latino. Um, any experience you all have with how uh, misinformation targets, um, you know, rural um, folks in particular? Um, one of the first things we, um, one of our first discussions with um, someone in Anson County who um, runs the Holla Center was um, how big a, a deal misinformation, disinformation was for rural folks because a lot of their communication because of broadband, et cetera, it's coming from their cell phones or, you know, in different social media platforms. Hi, it's Jackie again. One of, one of the things that we discovered um, as we were doing the voter registration in terms of misinformation and disinformation is that for our Latino um, Hispanic students, um, several of them that we um, offered an opportunity to register were apprehensive and they were apprehensive simply because um, they've been under the um, notion or someone has told them that the voter registration drive is like a decoy as an invitation to ICE to locate them and their parents who are undocumented. So they refrain from that um, electoral process because they've been duped to think that anything that they sign their name to that they give information such as an address or you know something like that, it's going to lead to ICE. And so we had to... Um, clarify for them that, that that was totally, totally not so, that they were, as long as they were American born citizens, that they had a right to vote. And that was not um, what that invitation to register to vote was about. So you have young people who have parents who don't speak the language and they are undocumented, but they have children who are now going into adulthood, but are US citizens. And so, 
that is a population in our rural community that we have to ensure that we reach them and really give them the information that they need so that they can, again, be a part of the engaging process. Thank you, um, Jackie. That was a, a great illumination of um, another way that, um, you know, disinformation impacts voters or potential voters. Um, and I don't know if anyone else has anything to add. I know when we did our first uh, vaccine event in uh, Marshville, we did it very close to um, an area where lots of um, Latino um, folks lived. And we had a, a Spanish speaker there on site. And one of the first folks that came, you know, there was concern about that, about, you know, could that be a trap? Even though it's free, we didn't have ID, you didn't have to prove any kind of citizenship to get access to a free back life-saving vaccine. And we we saw that once that one person got there and we stressed to them that you don't have to show ID, those things are not required. More folks from that community started to come because they felt comfortable. And so I wonder if there's, you know, to that point, how much of this disinformation or what you guys are working on is being put out there in other languages so that other folks that might be targeted can um, you know have access to information that um, pushes back against myths and disinformation or explains what it is. And if we're not doing it, let's think about it. <laughs> Making sure it's definitely more accessible. All right, any other questions? Dr. Hi. Ruff? I Wait, this is, um, this is the other Alexa on the call tonight. <laughs> <laughs> the New World Project Alexa. <laughs> the New World Project Alexa on the call. Um, I was getting um, a couple of uh, messages sent directly to me. One of them was specifically about um, political campaign mailers that come. They're not online. Um, and so I know I know you all have, have some advice on, on what we could do to report that as misinformation. So if you do see disinformation that comes across, um, please uh, put it into uh, the tip line because that way there's a record of it. Um, and we can use that record. Um, now, I do know about some candidate uh, flyers that have been going out um, into some communities with some uh, disinformation on them. Um, you know, that is a different set of laws. We're working mostly with community uh, platforms and uh, community standards, but at least there's a record of it. Um, we can uh, We can get it to the right people. <laughs> So maybe take a screenshot and submit it as a, an attachment. Thank you. Cynthia, yeah, I, just, I, uh, I just wanted to add one other thing that I was thinking about when we were here in the presentation. They were excellent, by the way, and very informative, very helpful. Um, that one of the challenges, the U.S. Census Bureau experience during the 2020 census was concerns around misinformation, disinformation campaigns, which discouraged many people from responding to the 2020 census. So one of the strategies that was employed to help combat that was, of course, trying to identify what we called uh, trusted voices in communities, informal leaders, in community, not always just the formal leaders, but informal indigenous leaders in communities that people trusted to try to make sure they have access to accurate information. For example, the slide that I asked Tyler to put back up, I think is really something very quick and easy to just share with anybody, you know, family, friends, anyone who trusts you could then refer when they see things that, you know, they're uncertain about, they can um, use those resources. But engaging trusted voices in communities that are often um, disengaged or not trusting of outsiders, uh, not trusting of government, um, 
would be very helpful. So you get people who know the community, they speak the language, they understand and appreciate the cultural um, and language differences to be able to communicate those things. Thank you. No, thank you so much. That is definitely, um, um, and very much what we saw even with the vaccine, having someone that spoke Spanish to them brought down some of the concerns and broke down some of those barriers. So exactly what you're saying, someone that people feel comfortable and trusted. Um, I see a question here about the mistrust of mainstream media um, and how does that translate to trust in local news stations and local papers? And is there a trend in misinformation in local news? So something that we do expect to be a place for um, you know trusted information and one of the things I found, um, and uh, Melissa, um, you might want to chime in, is you know a lot of these local stations are owned by one, you know, by corporations, and they pass down information that all of the stations share and read. Um, so I'm not sure if that's something um, you all have had to have looked at, and anything coming from trusted sources that are not necessarily as accurate. What I see in those cycles is not, uh, it's more of the the information they won't post because of uh, corporate issues um, that doesn't actually trickle down. Um, there hasn't been a lot of like local news stations reports and that just maybe they haven't got reported yet. Um, but we are seeing um, this kind of, uh, you know, corporate takeover a lot of our of our media and that should be very concerning to everybody and what does that mean for the uh, media that we uh, do uh, digest some yeah. more things aren't shared versus not that the, if it's information that's incorrect but you know when certain stations don't you know air things live <laughs> They air something different and then they report on it after the fact so that people can't see what's being said for themselves and make their own opinion about what's, you know, what was stated. And if I could just add as well, um, uh, I had mentioned ground news before. I, uh, they actually will, um, uh, they have the same um, metric system for local news as well. So you can see uh, if local stations, you know, uh, are owned by a particular um, corporation or whatever, and you can you can look that up for yourself and see, um, you know, uh, the the um, what could be influencing some of that coverage. So, I think that that's very helpful. Yes, and I saw your question also, um, Christina, that there are some great links, and Alexa um, wrote in the chat for those who may not be able to see the chat. Um, in the coming days, um, everyone who registered, even if those who didn't attend, we know we had a lot of folks that registered that aren't with us tonight, um, they will receive the link um, to the recording as well as the important links that have been shared. I can't wait to get some of those links. So <laughs> I think we've got some very informative um, links that many of us may not have had prior to tonight. All right, Alexa, do you have another? Oh, go ahead. Oh, then, oh, no, go ahead, Tyler. I see, I see Christina's hand is raised. Oh, oh. no, that's a thumbs up. Never mind. <laughs> um, and what do you say? Go ahead, Tyler. I, I was just going to say, and this is something I had forgotten to mention before. I'm going to put it in the chat as well. Um, uh, was something that we have been working on um, within um, our disinformation coalition is a uh, what happens after you vote one pager that explains to people uh, and it answers, addresses many questions that some have, so, you know, people who may be questioning the uh, integrity of our elections. And so we wanted to create something that uh, counteracted that and really address those specific questions. So I just put a, a PDF of that in the chat and it has those uh, answers and also links to um, with more information. And so feel free to share that uh, within, um, you know, uh, with those uh, who you know, or, or if you know of people who maybe are questioning, you know, well, you know, uh, is, how do we know our, our voting machine count is accurate? How do we know that the, the vote count is accurate? Well, 
we we um, um, answered all all those types of questions. So. Thank you. And just looking to see if I see any hands. Um, one um, last thing before we wrap up for me is I've had a lot of folks on here um, are folks that are concerned with misinformation, recognize that mis and disinformation are critical issues to our democracy, to our life in general. How do we reach those who may not understand it? that wouldn't sit on a Zoom, <laughs> you know, for an hour, a little over an hour on a, a you know, a, what night is this, a Tuesday night, um, learning this information. So what are your thoughts about how we make sure we get this word out for our, and I hate to keep saying YouTube because I think Facebook and Instagram and Twitter get a lot of publicity about this as an issue, but most of the millennials that I know get their information from YouTube that's where they're getting their mis and disinformation. So how do we, you know, get this out beyond those of us that are sitting on this Zoom? Go ahead, Alexa. Yeah, I think just bringing it up in natural conversation um, about um, what mis and disinformation is, uh, like, oh, I saw the craziest thing on Twitter. Isn't it crazy how, like, easy it is for misinformation to get on this platform. I think just making it a part of normal conversation, similar to how you would discuss politics or the local news, um, just making that a part of your conversation. And also, um, I think one thing um, that's kind of encouraging is that um, I think a lot of people in our lives probably want to vote for people who believe in our institutions and who are against mis and disinformation tactics and who are pro democracy. And so just bringing up candidates that would interest them, um, just because I, I really do think that a lot of Americans would be on that side if um, you just had a simple conversation with them. And so, yeah, I think just just bringing it up and bringing the one and a half hour Zoom to them, essentially. Love that. I think we need a more concerted effort among um, all of our advocates to reach out to young people um, on their terms. Um, and so, you know, whether that be through social media, uh, Reels, TikTok, you know, we need to, uh, you know, I'm trying to teach myself how to use some of uh, uh, TikTok and uh, Instagram and everything to figure out how I can reach young people too, um, learning from my own kids. Um, but yes, there needs to be a concerted effort to uh, meet people where they are. Yeah, we need to get a TikTok because I think that's where <laughs> the next, like the youngest generation lives is on TikTok versus some of these other platforms that a little that have been around a little bit longer. So it's like you and me are going to do a TikTok. <laughs> you know, we should, and I can see us putting misinformation and pointing to it. Yeah. <laughs> I see it, Melissa. All right. That's been recorded, so we need to work on it. <laughs> Tyler, go ahead. I, I, I think another um, uh, problem, and I mean, this is a, a bigger problem, uh, but the fact that we are so politically polarized and we are really living within these bubbles oftentimes uh, to where we, you know, all of our friends, you know, believe the same types of things. And so we, if we're interacting with only them, then, uh, you know, we're not reaching out. We are not uh, able to connect with those uh, who are um, different than us uh, and those who may think differently. Uh, and I really think that, you know, if we're really going to to make a big difference with this, we've got to do more to reach out to, um, you know, those who, that we, we may not generally, um, you know, it may not be within our group of friends or, or you know, with, with our, our family. Um, uh, you know, I, I, I know that's a bigger societal question and, and uh, probably difficult to uh, and I don't have all the answers, but I'm just saying, I, I think that that really is uh, the heart of, of this, uh, is trying to break through these bubbles. Uh, I mean, I remember I was listening to a podcast um, uh, and, and they were interviewing, there was this um, uh, uh, person who was being interviewed 
uh, and she was talking about how you know the the news where she gets her news, and she said that she gets her news from uh, the amazing Polly, which is someone on YouTube, uh, <laughs> and she believes the amazing Polly more than uh, she actually believes credible news sites. Mm -hmm. So um, I just think that's a great example. And I mean, how did she find out about this? I don't know, but it could be that, you know, a friend shared a link on Facebook or, you know, or, you know, just uh, shared it with her or, you know, I, I don't know. But I just think we've got to break out of these bubbles, essentially. Totally agree. And that, I mean, that's an amazing, amazing point. And um, as I, you know, start to think all of our panelists, one of the things that happens too with our social media is you click on one link and then they start feeding you more. And I think that's the other thing that it then continue, you continue to see content that reinforces maybe misinformation. Um, so, but as we come to a close and I'll, I'll turn it over to Alexa um, after this so she can close us out, but can you all join me in thanking Melissa, Alexa and Tyler for bringing this important discussion to us at the New Rural Project, the folks who joined this, those who are watching this on Facebook, you'll see it on our YouTube. So if you're watching this later, please, please share this information. This is such an important topic. Obviously, we talked a lot about how mis- and disinformation impacts electorals, elections, and those kind of things. But we know this impacts our everyday life. So please share this information. Thank you all for bringing all of this and your knowledge um, to um, this conversation. And with that, I'll turn it over to Alexa so she can um, wrap us up. Thank you so much. Thank you, Cynthia, for um, facilitating this very important conversation. Um, and thank you all for joining us. Um, so. We, we did schedule this until 8.30. We're trying to give you back about 15 minutes of your life right now. Um, you are free to go. Um, like we said, we will be sending out in the coming days. I will absolutely be sending out an email to everybody who has registered with a link to the recording as well as all of the resources that were presented tonight. Um, and I can also send out a file to the chat um, or I'll just put all of those resources into a document for everyone. But this is very important stuff. Um, one thing we want to ask you to do is please make your plan to vote. If you have not yet made a plan to vote, we ask you to do so. And we also want you to take five people with you. So when you go to those polls, plan to arrive with five. Talk to some of your friends, some of your neighbors. Don't be afraid to bring up these difficult conversations. They're a little bit uncomfortable sometimes, but we don't know sometimes if our next door neighbors are even registered to vote. That's where you start having those conversations and talking about sharing these good resources with people so that they know how to check this good information for themselves. Um, so we thank you very much um, again um, for all of your time. Talk with everybody you know, don't be shy and get out there and vote and make sure you're making good choices. So. Thank you again for joining us. Um, please follow us on all of our social media and we can start spreading the good stuff and the accurate information. And again, to our panelists, we cannot thank you enough. Um, all of you, we appreciate you. We hope you have a pleasant evening and we will see you again soon. If you have any ideas for our next quarter conversations for our young people, you just let me know. We're gonna stay while people are here in case anybody has an extra question, just waiting for the be the last one in the room sometimes. Yep, and we can stop the Facebook Live and then um, see if folks have any other um, conversation. That's it.